I've known Dr. Fallon almost my entire uh, time with Lyme disease. So in 87, when I started working with Lyme, there was Dr. Fallon there and his, uh, who was a, a leader already right off the, the bat. And so um, at the same time around 1990, there was this article in the New England Journal of Medicine with Legigian and it included steer where they said, boy, there's a lot of neurologic Lyme, there's encephalopathy um, and uh, neuropathy. And uh, they also had just so much irritability, fatigue, uh, anxiety, uh, you know, all the things we talk about today was already in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I was fascinated by that paper, the kinds of things that I see in my practice. And then just when I'm getting to know that, then comes along this Dr. Fallon, who with a group did a, some great papers on a, classic papers on neuropsychiatric aspects of Lyme. So even though we're, we're gonna be talking about his latest paper, this is already almost 20 years since he wrote some of the seminal papers on neuropsychiatric Lyme. So um, to Brian, I wanna say hello to Brian Fallon who's at Columbia and have him tell me a little bit about that 90, that early 90 period. And then we'll get into this uh, recently published paper on mental health and suicide. So Brian, go ahead. Sure, thanks, uh, thanks Dan for the introduction and uh, for all your work uh, over the years in helping patients with Lyme and, and tick-borne diseases. Uh, so that, that period in the early 90s was certainly a, um, for me, a, a pivotal moment because at the time I was a, just finished my psychiatry residency at Columbia. Um, I had started research in the area of anxiety disorder, specifically focusing on obsessive compulsive disorder. And I had observed that patients with um, who worry about illness nonstop, uh, hypochondriacs, have a lot of characteristics in common with the OCD patients. Um, and that I thought perhaps the treatments so applicable to OCD might be helpful for the hypochondriac. So that was my research focus. And that's what I thought I would be spending my career doing, which was working with these severely anxiety, uh, severe anxiety disorders and obsessional disorders. Around the si same time in the early 90s, I had um, a family member who got very sick with Lyme disease. Uh, and, then an, and that got me educated about Lyme disease. And I learned that uh, the testing was not perfect, even though it was being claimed to be perfect, the serologic tests were being claimed to be 99% accurate. I learned that people can get better, but then they relapse and uh, they have symptoms. And at that point, the physicians didn't know what to do to try to help them. Um, so there were treatment questions, there were diagnostic questions. Um, and then there was political issues too, which is, which is that it was very hard for um, the patients because they would go to their doctor and they would say, I have the same symptoms I had when I first got Lyme disease. And let's say the symptoms return, so let's say two or three or four months later. And the local doctor who they knew so well and loved so well told them, well, look, you've gotten the standard treatment. This is what is being recommended by the experts and any symptoms beyond this uh, is not due to Lyme disease. It must be something else like fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, or um, perhaps you're depressed. Why don't you go see Dr. Fallon? And so I start to see some of these patients actually in my hypochondria referral network, but I recognized quite, quite quickly, these people did not have hypochondriasis. They did not have a long history of anxiety and obsessional worry. They did not worry about a whole bunch of other diseases. They were worried about Lyme disease because they had it and, and now they're having relapsing symptoms and they're sick. So these people did not have hypochondriasis, but clearly they had something else. And, and I thought at the time that they had persistent symptoms um, and relapsing symptoms related to Lyme disease. So I got, as I, as I mentioned, I was studying anxiety disorders, but I was working in this phenomenal group at Columbia, uh, this group that focused on clinical trials, trying to test different treatments to see what worked. Uh, and they also were neuroimaging experts. Um, 
so I thought I could apply some of those tools that I had learned in uh, psychiatry to help the patients with chronic symptoms associated with uh, Lyme disease. And if you don't mind, I'd like to say one more thing, which is really, I think, kind of an interesting vignette, which was early on, probably one of the first things that got me interested in the psychiatric aspects of Lyme disease was as a result of a call by Polly Murray, who was the mother in Old Lyme, Connecticut, who first reported uh, the children with this uh, cluster of our arthritic cases, juvenile, supposed juvenile rheumatoid arthritis to Yale. I mean, to the to the uh, Connecticut Health Authorities, and that brought that brought brought the Yale researchers in. But she called my wife up, who's a psychiatrist, Jennifer Niels, and said, "You know, you are a psychiatrist. You should study the psychiatric aspects of Lyme disease. And your husband's a researcher. He should consider doing it too." And uh, so the two of us went to visit Polly Murray at her home and interviewed some of her neighbors, who uh, Polly thought might have psychiatric symptoms after Lyme disease. And after that interviewing three neighbors, we had no clue as to whether the psychiatric symptoms had anything to do with Lyme disease, but we thought we should do a study. So we designed a survey that we sent out to a thousand clinician offices. Dan, I don't know if you were one of those cl cl clinicians who handed out the survey in your office, but um, uh, we got, of the thousand surveys, we got a 400 back and we compared it. We had a control group of people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis or non-Lyme arthritis, and we had another control group of people who had lupus. And we wanted to know, is depression greater in the Lyme group or the same as in lupus or in a painful disease like uh, rheumatoid arthritis? Um, and we looked at panic attacks too, and we looked at generalized anxiety disorder. And what did we find? We found that depression was four times, reported four times more often in the Lyme disease group than in the lupus group, and four times more often than in the rheumatoid arthritis group. So that really surprised me. And it suggested that there's something about Lyme disease and depression that needed to be studied. So that really is what led me to continue working in the area. Yeah, so I thought that the, the you know, starting with the Legidian paper in a New England Journal of Medicine and then your work, set us up for much more detail and an, an insight into it. And so um, I think in recognition of all that work besides what I needed to know and what my patients needed to know is that uh, there was a, um, an effort made to put together, um, I think they ended up with $3 million to end up with an endowed chair um, at Columbia, which uh, they, they uh, gave, uh, Columbia, an opportunity for you to go up and uh, do some academic work and some leadership. So tell me who the, fund, the funders were, because I know Lyme Disease Association with yeah, Pat was Smith Lyme was one. With Pat Smith and the Global Lyme Alliance, which is what it's called now, but back then it was called Time for Lyme. And the leaders of that were Diane Blanchard and Debbie Siciliano. And they motivated all of their friends to raise money. And they worked so hard to try to raise that $2 million uh, amount which was required in, in order to establish an endowed center. So I'm so grateful to them for what they did because what that allowed was that funding stability allowed me to hire a research assistant who could stick with me, a research coordinator who could stay with me for a while. And without that, it's very, as you know, it's very hard to do research uh, on a, on a, on a full-time level uh, without being able to offer some stability. And it's hard to get grants, and it's specifically very hard to get grants if you're studying chronic persistent symptoms. If you're studying erythema migrans, in those days at least, it wasn't so hard because uh, that was the gold standard diagnosis. And if you studied that, nobody could critique your grant because you were using the gold standard. But, um, but it was hard to get funding to support chronic Lyme studies. Yeah, I think that the um, most of the money was poured into rather simple design, early Lyme, which is the first thing was recognized. That's it was right. the, that rash, the Bell's palsy, an arthritic joint, uh, sometimes meningitis, but neuropsych issues was never uh, put on the CDC uh, surveillance case definition. So if it's not an X case definition, it's easy to over be overlooked. So that's why I was nice to have your constant presence through the last 20 years on uh, 
on the neuropsych issues. Um, even uh, when you did the clinical trial at Columbia um, on encephalopathy uh, memory, is that uh, there were a lot of choices what should be the outcome. But um, uh, this whole memory concentration is just one, one small aspect of uh, neuropsych issues. And so I'm sure in hindsight, you were trying to think, you know, fatigue certainly was much better in that trial. Yes. In hindsight, you, know, I... you probably reread that, redid that, con that paper, the 2008 paper so much thinking, what could I have done? And how could I have uh, recruited more patients? And how could I have done uh, uh, brought it all together with with a trial? Yes, it was hard to recruit the patients for that study because were, our criteria were so rigorous and rigid in terms of who we were allowing into the study. Um, but I agree with you. If it was a study of cognitive impairment, and cognitive impairment usually in the Lyme patients is relatively mild. Sometimes it's severe, but usually relatively mild. So. Um, so it's hard to show improvement when you have a relatively mild problem. If you have a more severe problem, such as the fatigue or the pain, it's, the, it's much easier if you have an effective treatment to show benefit. So in that study, we did not, as you know, we didn't find improvement that lasted in cognition. There was improvement at week 12, just at the margin of significance, but it was, it was not sustained. But there was sustained improvement in physical functioning and pain among the more impaired and fatigue as well. Yeah, so when I when I look back at that particular trial, is that in my own practice, I, I agree is that the patients have significant impairment of their processing or memory or word finding uh, from their standard, but yeah. they don't mm -hmm. seem to have as easy to measure. Uh, at least people who volunteer for trials are well enough to be able to volunteer for a trial well right. enough to put up with the design of the trial, understand the trial, be consented, and that population um, wasn't as quite as sick as some of the patients that I see in my practice. Yeah, let me share with you a, a few examples of, you know, some of what I saw early on with the psychiatric aspects. I mean, I saw children who would get incredibly out of control and, and uh, do incredibly impulsive things and talk about suicide and sometimes run to the windows if they were going to try to jump out the window. Um, and after appropriate antibiotic treatment, some of those patients, some of those children actually did very well. Um, I saw um, children and adults who had profound light sensitivity. So they had to wear sunglasses uh, during the day and, at, and even at night in their home, uh, profound sound sensitivity, so just normal sounds like the clicking of your teeth when you're chewing uh, uh, or, or uh, any little noise would sound outrageously loud to the individual with uh, this sound sensitivity problem. And I remember thinking at the time that it was like, an, it was almost like a reflex where if I clicked a sound, made a sound in front of one of those patients, they would, they would almost jump and, 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 and let out a, a fright, a frightful sound. And that's because it was, it almost, it almost looked like it went right to the amygdala, the fear center of the brain and startled them, them so much. Uh, and, and it was also painful. So these poor patients with persistent uh, relapsing symptoms, they had sensory hyperarousal, they had fatigue, they had joint pain and muscle pain. They had cognitive slowing. They had uh, word finding problems, um, and it wasn't it wasn't really clear how to help those patients. Um, and I also saw some patients, Dan, who who uh, had manic episodes. Uh, like I remember one person who was hospitalized for mania, and after he was discharged, somebody thought, "Let me test him for for Lyme disease. Let's do a spinal tap." And it was positive, and he was treated, and he got dramatically better. So um, it's not common to develop mania, but it can happen. Uh, it's not common to develop psychotic symptoms after Lyme at all, but it, but it can happen. So it's certainly a peculiar illness, uh, um, and it, that can cause some very significant problems. Well, I wanted to get right down to this this paper. I read this paper uh, that that uh, Dr. Brian Fallon did uh, with uh, this Danish cohort. And there were like 
such good data for millions of people who were admitted. And then he broke it down into uh, people who had uh, Lyme disease. And then he broke it even further into the mental health and suicidal issues. So can you share with us that process of, and a little bit more about that paper? Because it's uh, fascinating. Sure. Well, about three years ago, I was attending a conference at Columbia and Michael Benrose, who's one of the, he's the lead investigator in Denmark at the Mental Health Center of Copenhagen. Um, and he had just finished a study that he conducted with Susan Suedo at the NIH on pandas, looking to see whether using the epidemiologic data available in Denmark, which as many people know, has one of the best uh, registries of of patient data from, from hospital diagnoses uh, anywhere in the world. And it's quite complete. So it's a wonderful, it's like an epidemiologist, an epidemiologist dream to have that database. So he had done this great study and shown that there was uh, some increase in uh, OCD and I think attentional disorders uh, associated with strep compared to those who hadn't had it. So I, so I listened to that talk and I, was, I got really excited and I thought, here is someone who actually can study uh, a similar question, uh, but focused on Lyme disease better than anybody else in the world. Um, so at the intermission, I asked him, would you be willing to collaborate with me if I could obtain the funds um, to do a study of Lyme, uh, of mental disorders and suicidal behaviors and suicide after Lyme Borreliosis? He said, sure. So um, that's what started. So I wrote a grant, the Global Lyme Alliance, uh, Michael and I wrote the grant together, Michael Benrose and I wrote it together. Uh, he was the principal investigator. Um, I was the guide uh, and uh, he conducted the study. He and his team, outstanding team, Treen Matson, I have to name, who, who was the, the lead person over there doing the data crunching, data analysis and, and Ernette Erlangson. Uh, as well. So it was a team of three people from there and myself working on this project. And it's, it was stunning what they did. So in a short period of time, they were able to look at the data of 7 million people spanning 1994 to 2016, so a 22-year period. Uh, and they looked at all people from age three to age 104 uh, during that inter interval who had uh, data. So everybody in, and everybody in the, in, the, in, in the entire population was included in this. So the exposed individuals were those who were diagnosed with Lyme disease in the hospital setting, either in the ER or in the inpatient unit or uh, as an outpatient. Um, so that was the exposure. And then we looked to compare that group that got exposed to the rest of the population who had never had a hospital diagnosis of Lyme disease. So that was everybody else in the 7 million. Uh, and there were 12,000 some, some odd uh, Lyme patients during that period. And then we looked to see what's the frequency of psychiatric disorders during the interval after that hospital diagnosis of Lyme disease. And is it greater in the people who had Lyme disease compared to those who didn't. And what we found was that there was a increase in mental disorders, in affective disorders in particular, there was like a 42% increased rate of affective disorders, which means depressed depression. Um, there was a 75% increase in suicide and a twofold increase in uh, suicidal behaviors after Lyme borreliosis compared to those who didn't have it. So that was consistent with what we thought we might find. It was um, disturbing to see the increased rate of suicidal behaviors. Uh, and it was obviously disturbing to see the increased uh, frequency of suicide. Uh, now the rate, the number of suicides over that 22 year period in this small country, Denmark, that only has like seven, seven million people or 8 million people in it, about the size of New York City, um, was about 25 suicides over that 22 year period. So maybe roughly one person a year if you wanted to average it out. So it didn't, it did not account for a large number of suicides in Denmark at all, but 
it definitely was increased after hospital diagnosed uh, Lyme borreliosis. That was a pivotal study. I mean, it was really great what they did. With, um, with this database, it isn't you at the bedside. It's you know actual data of doctors who are in 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 practice recording these particular codes. So, you know, I always find in practice that there's an awful lot of people who have suicide ideation or think about suicide. Dr. Bransfield has talked a lot about suicide, and of course, he has more of a psychiatric practice, so he's bound to have more. But I think you know, it probably underestimates those who feel like, you know, the suicide issues or suicide ideation. These are ones who just happen to meet the criteria for the database. So can you comment a little bit about uh, uh, the generalizability of that, uh, of those findings? Sure. Um, Denmark is in Europe, as everybody knows, and Europe is loaded with, uh, two other genome species of Borrelia. There's Borrelia guarinii, which primarily causes neurologic problems, and there's Borrelia afzelii, which primarily causes skin problems. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes arthritis here, is not, there's maybe 10% of the uh, cases are Borrelia burgdorferi cases, so that's not as common. So the, you asked about generalizability of what we found in Denmark. Let's say how generalized it generalizable as it here to the United States. What I can say is that Borrelia burgdorferi is a much more inflammatory um, type of Borrelia than the Danish type of Borrelia. So what that means is that if you have more inflammation, you might have a more severe disease. And we know from numerous studies over the last decade or two that um, inflammation can lead to depression. Um, and if you look at the PET scans of individuals with post-treatment Lyme disease, actually you see uh, ele elevation, of activation of microglia, which is a sign of inflammation in the brain. Dr. Alcott and his group, Dr. Coughlin, uh, did this wonderful study, a small study, but it was a study of microglial activation and they found it was indeed elevated in the post-treatment line patients compared to the controls. So it's, so was the data generalizable? I would think it might be a higher here in, in the United States, rates of depression and, uh, and suicidal uh, behaviors um, and mental disorders in general. Five minutes. I wanted to talk a little bit before we get cut off. I think we'll get cut off about the trial that I'm doing. Sure, I'd love to There's hear so that. There's so much mental distress about should I take the vaccine? What happens if I get COVID? And so a lot of Lyme patients, it's a stressful event. You know, first of all, how uh, much should I do? What if I stay home? What if I get COVID? And so, uh, so far, there have been 900 people who have been kind enough to complete the survey on, on my website, you know, Daniel Cameron, MD. And it's a formal website approved by the IRB, Institutional Review Board, which means I can publish the results. I can publish as, and I think I'm looking at is not only for publication, but database for people who are doing work in the area to kind of um, understand the topic. So um, it's, um, there's a lot of people with mental health, uh, but at first I wanted to give you a couple of facts, which is that 23% uh, had COVID already. So it, um, it gives me, um, a little me a measure of what their what their uh, fit their symptoms are their function their global assessment of general health and so i can look at already at what does covid do to someone who's had lyme not only just had lyme but severe lyme with poor function so i'm running those numbers i also have um, a lot of people worried about the vaccine so actually two thirds of people in the survey have either taken the vaccine or are scheduled for the vaccine when they fill, out, fill it out. So I don't have all the numbers yet to share with you, but the, the numbers are coming in um, um, with much more insight into uh, this epidemic uh, that we're having. And uh, particularly Lyme, if you've already been hit, my understanding is that the Lyme is, seems to be the biggest hit 
and got could not COVID, not the vaccine, but the Lyme and, and the severity of Lyme is uh, much more determinate than whether you get COVID or not. So, but I think some Lyme patients already know how sick they are. And no matter what they hear about long haulers, what they hear about uh, COVID is that they, uh, they're, they're affected quite a bit. So just thought I'd uh, um, urge people to keep filling out that survey. Uh, what I want, why I mentioned it to you, uh, Dr. Fallon, is that there's a fair amount of people in life uh, with Lyme who have mental health issues anyway. There's a fair amount with encephalopathy where their memory's off, their concentration's off, they're fatigued, they have sensory issues. And so the more people fill out the survey, I can drill down to the topics that you would talk about. Yeah. What that subset of neuropsych issues. Um, yeah. That the, and then we could take a look at what happens. So I was hoping that um, we can sit down sometime and kind of run through and share. Uh, I'd love to do that. that. It's a great thing. It's a great thing that you did to do this survey. Nine hundred plus people is going to be fantastic. You can really do a lot of excellent analysis of that data. Uh, chat room here. It says there's a question that uh, it says, "Can psychiatric symptoms be the sole presentation of Lyme disease?" And most often, uh, not. But sometimes, yes. So sometimes you may develop paranoia. Uh, and then four months later, suddenly you'd be diagnosed with Lyme encephalopathy or Lyme encephalitis. Or patients have been presented with mania. Uh, and then weeks later, they get diagnosed with Lyme encephalitis. So usually, other symptoms start to manifest, whether it's cognitive, whether it's radiculopathy, radicular pain. Um, but there have been cases. There was a case uh, in the literature of a patient who developed schizophrenia type symptoms. Um, and uh, she, was, she was spinal tapped only because she wasn't responding to standard treatments. And they did discover Borrelia antibodies in her spinal fluid. She got treated with antibiotics and her symptoms uh, resolved. Um, so that was very a wonderful finding that they discovered that. But the eerie thing about that case was, was that uh, there were, at least according to the way it was written, there were no other manifestations of Lyme. There weren't any manifestations of Lyme that would make someone suspect uh, Lyme disease. So I think it's rare, but, but we don't know how rare it is. I think someone also mentioned the PANS and, and Lyme, and there's such an overlap of PAN. PANS was originally a pandas, uh, where it was related to strep, but because so many people who had overlapping diagnosis, they had uh, Lyme disease issues that they've kind of dropped that it has to be strep. So that, in fact, it's fascinating that it's pediatrics and they're looking at neuropsych. So just like uh, your work, Brian, and my, and my interest is that you're bringing neuropsych issues in pediatric cases right to the forefront. It's like, a, it, for a while, it was seemed like a totally um, unrelated thing because they thought it was uh, only autoimmune issues. But it turns out that that, that knowledge is, and is, you know, we're learning from uh, how much the overlap is. And I tend to want to give Lyme disease a chance for tick-borne a chance with the PANS patients before doing the IVIG, but there's different treatment protocols. That's right. I mean, IVIG can be enormously helpful for some people. I've certainly seen it help help a variety of patients who had were no longer no longer benefiting from the antibiotics, um, and they had, let's say, neuropathic symptoms that might suggest that there was an immune mediated problem, and then they found a number of their problems improved. Um, I don't, so, just on the pandas front, I remember a young a young girl who developed rip-roaring overnight OCD, horrific OCD. She was hospitalized. They, they uh, treated her with psychiatric medication, low amount, it didn't help. And then someone thought to test her for Lyme and she tested floridly positive on all the tests. And so she was treated with antibiotics and three months later she was doing great and she had a follow-up and she was of so six months and she was still doing great. So, so sometimes you'll see Lyme, Lyme triggered uh, PANS type symptoms. Yeah, I have um, an awful lot of patients with neuropsych issues where they get better with oral. And so it seems like, um, you know, the IV, which is useful, there's so often that an oral uh, 
treatment of work. Oral, oral, oral treatments can be enormously helpful as, 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 as we've learned over the years. And doxycycline yeah. does cross the blood-brain barrier. Aminocycline crosses the blood-brain barrier. So those are really two excellent treatments to, to consider. Micro, uh, microglial activation, inflammation is reduced by, uh, my, by aminocycline. We know that. Um, another point I want to make is psychiatric treatment is essential. So don't think the only thing that you can do is uh, medical treatments. Psychiatric treatment is essential components of your overall health care. And um, Lyme disease can cause psychiatric problems. However, you need to treat those psychiatric problems seriously and aggressively with the appropriate psychiatric care as well as the appropriate medical care. Sometimes I get calls from people saying, I'm really sick, I have very intense psychiatric symptoms, but I don't want to go into the psychiatric unit. Uh, because I'm afraid that I, I won't get the antibiotics. And it's probably true. When you go into the psychiatric unit, they probably will stop your antibiotics. But if going into the psychiatric unit allows you to get uh, really good psychiatric care and prevents you from killing yourself, then it's essential that you go into the psychiatric uh, unit for help. And you'll be discharged within two weeks or three weeks, and then you can go get whatever other care you want, whether it's antibiotic or you, you need. Um, but if you need psychiatric care, you've got to get it. And people can do so much better. I've, met, I've had patients in my office who have been treated with uh, years of antibiotics who had neuropathic pain, and I gave them some symptomatic treatments for neuropathic pain, uh, and they got a lot better. Uh, so it's, it's, there are many different ways to get better, and, it's, and uh, we need to try many of them. We need to study them. One of the great things I want to mention is that the Cohen Foundation has just given us a big grant to open up a clinical center in New York and, and, a, and a clinical trials network. And the whole goal really is to, is to have a research integrated program that will help uh, clarify some of the treatment options for patients that work. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll be busy for the next few years. Well, it's, uh, there's uh, quite a list of things to, to work on. So this is, I think you had 16 million or something. Yeah, um, it was a, it was a very, it was a and then it was a, And also the backing of uh, the Cohen um, um, group um, is, uh, it's great to not just have dollars, but have, uh, have support and leadership. Well, I want to mention on the neuropsych things is that I, I, I find that safety is important. So I always tell people, if you have a site, psych issues is to make sure your safety is important because we can always work on on the line uh, hopefully there'll be a day where you can trust going to a psych program and getting treated mm -hmm. I, I i myself find that i have i spend most of my time counseling you know i don't do alternative medicine i leave that to the people that love that but that's why I can devote so much time to counseling, to behavioral modification, to uh, you know, working through the family issues, the social issues, uh, the exactly. brothers and sisters all the time. And it, it helps daily to keep reinforcing that. I think that's a, as important as, uh, as what pill I pick. That's absolutely right. Now you sound, you're a very caring physician. And, and you know, as you know, People's identity is totally shaken up by this illness. You know, they were high functioning, and now all of a sudden they're sick. They're parents, and they want to take care of their children, but they can't because they're in bed. You know, so and or they're economically stressed because they can't work. So it's it's a it has a profound impact those life stressors. Yeah, I was in an airport in Washington D.C. A, a few months ago, and and someone ran to me because we were in this transport uh, bus, and they recognized me from. 20 years ago, because um, someone was so sick, and so she barely got through high school, but uh, she was just getting ready in time to go to college, so she became a nurse and and had two, uh, got married and had two uh, grandchildren for them, and so, you know, that it was nice to see it when um, when people get back on track. It's a, it's a blessing uh, to uh, be in practice right now and take on these patients as so many people uh, benefit from your work and, they, and, and they, they benefit from me trying hard. You know, we're all struggling to try to see what we can do in, in these tough times. And, and, and the COVID just it's add another layer of uh, problems that are out there. 
Yeah, COVID has been so hard for so many patients, especially people who live in isolation. It's just been terribly hard. As a, as a psychiatrist, I've found it to be the toughest year I've ever had in my practice in terms of the stress and anxiety and distress that patients have experienced. You know, fortunately, we're on the other end of it at this point, it seems, and, and that's great. Dr. Fallon, do you have anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, I just, I, well, one thing is if you're, because, you know, we we're talking about depression and suicide. If you are, if you're listening to this and you're having suicidal thoughts and you're thinking of doing something, go to the ER. There also is a suicide hotline. I'll give you the number. It's 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. And they can be very helpful as well. Um, and I also want to acknowledge my colleagues at Columbia who do such great work. Dr. Shannon Delaney is a child and uh, adult psychiatrist, and she's totally committed to helping patients with these infection-triggered neuropsychiatric syndromes. And Dr. John Kelp, who's a superb uh, neuropsychologist, and we have family medicine doctors working with us as well, and integrative medicine doctors. So uh, I'm grateful to people like you, Dan, for sticking with it all these years and, uh, and uh, other colleagues like you. Um, it's, been a, it's, it's been a lot of fun actually working together to try to help these uh, many people who are sick. But um, I agree with what you said also about what a, what a wonderful thing is to meet people years later who have recovered from this, who were extremely ill at the time and to see that they actually have gone on to live really wonderful and good lives. And so that gives hope. And I've seen people turn around who were sick for 15 years, suddenly turn around and get better. And why, you know, it's, who knows exactly why, but um, that just makes me think that uh, the, the body and the brain are quite resilient uh, in, 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 in many patients. So let me close on my end is that because of the, you know, my latest project is this uh, professional survey, I'm just putting a shout out to anybody with Lyme, even if you've never had the vaccine, even if you don't, never had COVID, if you're, you're, even if you're thinking, I'm never going to take either, I'm never going to get COVID, I'm never going to get a shot, I still, still want to follow people who are out there uh, with Lyme. You know, many of the ones that are filling this out are, are healthy and well, and so over time, uh, those are going to get represented instead of just the sickest patients. So if anybody can fill that out uh, and encourage their friends to fill it out, then, and the last group that, I, that I'm just beginning to work on is the age 12 to 18. They're eligible for the study. And I only got a dozen kids in the study, but it would be nice to have a lot more so I can get into that important middle, middle age uh, and uh, adolescent, uh, I mean, what middle school and adolescent type of issues. So that's a plug out for that. So I'm gonna sign off. Uh, so Brian, anything else? Any last word? I think we're done. Oh, thank you for sticking with us till 8.45, all the listening audience here. So thank you. Thank you everyone. So goodbye everyone.